welcome to Chad Silversmithing. Today I thought we could focus on making a simple turquoise ring in kind of a traditional style that's pretty basic but also comes out very beautiful I think. And it's an accessible sort of style for a beginner to make and I think it's a good starting project for some people. Alright, let's get started. The things you'll need to make this particular ring are um, some bezel strip. I like uh, 3 16 inch uh, plain uh, fine silver bezel strip. Um, some twisted wire. Uh, I use 18 gauge, two pieces that are twisted into kind of a rope. Uh, probably in the future I'll do a, a quick tip on how to do that. It's real easy. Uh, I picked out kind of an abstract shape uh, turquoise and I thought it was kind of a pretty one so I thought we could use him today. Uh, you'll need a piece of uh, 26 gauge sterling sheet, uh, big enough for the stone plus a little bit extra. And then uh, a little bit of 14 gauge square wire, uh, which is what we're going to use for the band. So let's get started with this project. First thing I'm going to do is make a bezel. So this is a habit you should get out of, of putting stones on the pad if you do this. Uh, I don't know uh, how many times I've seen somebody when I wasn't paying too much attention to what's going on uh, somebody in one of my classes uh, cook their stone because they they get used to working on it setting it on their pad and then when they start soldering something they'll cook their stone so bad idea to get into the habit of uh, so I'm not going to do that for you today so let's file the end of this bezel Get it flat. I usually use the needle nose pliers to kind of roughly get a shape for the stone like this to get it started before I set it down on the table like that. And we'll just kind of lay it over that and tighten it up as much as we can with our fingers. I have to lean over the view here for a second. see that there. When I cut the bezel, I'm going to actually, uh, they meet right here, but I'm going to add a little tiny bit extra. I usually tell people about the width of the pick that I'm going to use to scratch it to make the mark there. And then I'm just going to cut it off right there. And then I'll have to file that end flat. And then I'll be done with the bezel for, for that unless I mess up which is always possible. One of the things I've noticed with my students over the years is that uh, they really struggle with getting a straight surface with a file and that is one of those skills that comes to you with time and practice I also struggled with that at first but after you've done it for a year or two then you start to get the hang of it and it's much easier to get a straight surface alright to make a, a bezel for me I solder it by uh, first of all first of all after it's all filed and everything I uh, make it into roughly a square or a rectangle shape like this and I'm going to move that those guys kind of meet in the middle Oopsie. Okay. one of the things I do when I'm making bezels is to make sure that these guys the ends of these uh, are pushing together right if you move it past it uh, where they meet a little ways and bend it back and forth a couple of times it work hardens the bottom and makes it so they're kind of springing towards each other and once you do that uh, they're they're pushing together a little better and you'll have uh, fewer problems when you go to solder the bezel okay put my solder there's my solder for a bezel I usually cut a piece that's about an eighth of an inch by an eighth of an inch couple of spares floating around just in case I lose one or something. Right. Just 
spray a little flux on there. Dry it. Oops. Pick up my piece of solder. And... Whoopsie. I didn't make this very square, so it's got a little slope on it, so it doesn't kind of seem to ski right off of there. <laughs> All right. Okay, get that guy soldered. When you're soldering bezels, it takes about four seconds to get them to solder and about five seconds to melt if you're not real cautious about getting it off pretty quick. Uh, a lot of times it'll slump a little bit and start to pull apart. And then you end up with a, the center point soldered a little bit with a crack on either side. And that's fixable, but um, not necessarily desirable. So if you can avoid it, it's better. Okay, dry this guy off. I shape bezels by using the very tips of the needle nose pliers to mostly pinch out the sharp corners. Uh, when I see people struggling with bezels, a lot of times it's because they're sticking the pliers all the way through to reshape it. Uh, that tends to create a whole bunch of flat spots because the, the width of the jaws uh, that'll just kind of put big flat spots in it like that. So if you just pinch lightly to push out the uneven spots, it becomes sort of amorphously smooth. Okay, and when you start to get it like that, I can start to kind of eyeball my shape of my stone here. I need to narrow it down over here a little bit. Okay. Like that. Now, when you get it pretty close, you can push it right over the stone like that, okay. and that seemed to fit pretty good. So I'm going to turn it over and, and smooth out the rest of it here a little bit. And I have a little bit of extra room there, but not so much as to where I think I need to worry about it. There's a certain amount you can get by with, uh, and once, you, uh, once you've done this a few times, you kind of get a feel for how much extra bezel you can deal with and how much you have to uh, probably recut your solder joint and take a little sliver out. But I think that's relatively well shaped. Um, when I'm making one of these, uh, this one's going to have a little rope that goes around it. It's just kind of be a basic sort of southwestern-y design. Um, this 18-gauge uh, wire uh, twisted together uh, is the easiest way to do it is in a just chuck it right into a drill and hook it over a nail or something. Um, I'll do a video on that uh, not too far in the future. It's one of those kind of quick, fun things that's easy to do and, and produces a good result. So. Uh, but first things first, I have a little chunk of this left from uh, another project, so I'm going to go ahead and file the end of this flat. Most people I've met have a filing face. It's usually this. I'm not sure why people stick their tongues out while they file, but I've noticed over the years that a lot of people do. All right, so once I got it uh, filed up flat on the end, I'm going to kind of roughly shape it with my pliers to get it kind of sort of in the shape here. The thing about putting a rope around one of these guys is you want it to be super tight because if you have any gaps between the rope and the bezel, it looks pretty amateurish. And... Uh, we don't want we don't want your projects to look amateurish. So when I do cut these guys, um, normally when I'm cutting something, I leave a little bit extra for filing purposes. But since I want this to be so snug, I'm going to make a mark right where they meet, <clears throat> and I'm going to cut it so that 
when I file it, it's actually going to be slightly too small. So where did my wire cutters go? Hmm. Oh, they're there. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to snip this off. The reason we can do this is the twisted wire is two wires that are not soldered together that are just twisted tightly and they will stretch open as you put pressure on them a little bit and the spiral will become a little less steep uh, and then it becomes uh, too loose. So if we cut it to where it's just a tiny bit too small, it'll be too snug to fit over that and we have to kind of force it over and that way you get a really tight fit which is nice and ends up looking a little bit more professional. Okay, fun thing about this is you can go to the to the effort to line up the twists on these guys when you go to solder them. But generally the pattern of the twist is confusing enough to the eye that uh, without without really even doing anything other than just kind of putting them together it's difficult to find that once it's soldered together, especially once it's all polished and everything. Almost nobody will be able to find that. Of course, except for you, because you're your own worst critic, just if you're anything like me. So uh, we're just going to use a little bit of solder there. I'm probably going to pick solder this because it's easiest for me to do that. So I'm going to give it a little squirt of flux there, crusty. One of the things about twisted wire, too, uh, it acts like a wick. Uh, because it's got a seam running down the entire length of it and solder likes to run down seams really easily especially if there's a lot of flux on them and so when this does flow it has a tendency to just go zzz all the way around through the whole rope which makes it a lot more stiff than uh, it is right now uh, and harder to bend but it also uh, stiffens it up and makes it stronger too so I'm going to go ahead and solder this here and I think it only ran part way on this one which is fine when we solder it down to the base, it'll probably fill in itself anyway. But uh, I just wanted these to be attached at this point. Let's cool that off and dry it off. Okay. If you're new to this, and you'll notice that the color of this changes a lot. Uh, sterling silver is made out of 92.5% uh, silver. That's why it's stamped 925 usually. Uh, and seven and a half percent copper. Now when you're heating it over and over again uh, sometimes a little bit of that copper migrates to the surface and oxidizes and turns kind of orange or pink. So that's what you're seeing there. Alright. I'm just going to do a little manual shaping here. And then I'm going to push it down over here like that. Actually, I got pretty close on the size. See right here, there's a little bit of a gap. But I think probably if I shape this just right, um, it'll be okay. I'm just going to squish that a little bit flatter so it rides a little closer to the bezel when, I, when I'm done. I think that'll be okay. If there had been much extra space beyond that after I did this, I probably would have uh, redone it, cut a little piece out, and resoldered it. But I, think, I think that'll be just okay. All right. So one of the things that I do that the the gentleman who I learned from always thought was funny and made fun of me for. Uh, in good nature uh, was that when you go to solder this rope down to a surface uh, it takes quite a bit of solder because you have a whole bunch of little raised uh, areas that are only in contact with the sheet in those spots with gaps between them and so use quite a bit of solder you can get it to run all the way around and fill in those gaps but as a rule solder doesn't like to fill in gaps in general uh, so what I do is I take my file and on the side that's going to be down to the sheet I'll file it sort of flat I know this is a single cut but when you're filing like this it's easiest 
to do that. So what I'm trying to do is to create more of a single flat surface that'll lay against the sheet for when the solder starts to flow so it sticks down nicely and neatly. I wonder if I have a filing face. I, I don't know. I probably scowl when I file. I've been accused of being scowly before. Okay. So I just got it a little bit flatter like that. It's not perfect, but it should get those uh, closer in contact, so I'll have a little less trouble getting that to solder down nicely. So I'm going to put this back around here. I'm going to pop that stone back out. Okay, so here's my little piece of 26 gauge sheet, which after I cut it, I flattened it out a little bit with the pliers because a lot of times uh, you'll end up with a little bit of a curve in it after you, after you cut it out. And that makes it a little harder to solder stuff too. So with this, position that. So I usually cut the piece of sheet after I do the making the, uh, the rope and the bezel, but since I wanted to have a view of what the materials were going to be, I cut a piece of sheet in advance. So I'm, I'm pretty close to the minimum that I could use on this piece here and still get by with it. I want to have plenty of room for that rope to solder down to that sheet as well as the bezel to solder down to the sheet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, flux it, dry the flux, and then uh, to get the bezel soldered down, I'm going to throw a few pieces of solder in there and I'll use my pick and push them up against the edges so that they're in contact with the bezel and the bottom. And then I'll also lean a few pieces on the outside rope here so they're touching the bottom and the rope. And uh, quite a bit of solder. I, I use quite a bit of solder in this operation because it really gets it to solder nicely if you do that. So let's cut a little bit more solder. Sorry about seeing the top of my head sometimes. I forget uh, that I'm filming when I get started and then I just start leaning over and stuff. So I will attempt to not do that as much. Let's get this guy going here. Get him all hosed down with flux. Okay. The flux tends to bubble up high and, and if you keep heating it, it'll settle back down again. Uh, I usually take it through that stage so that it's easier to put your solder where you want it to go. When it's all bubbled up, the solder won't necessarily sit where you want it to. So I'm going to throw a couple pieces in here. Notice these are pretty big pieces. I see a lot of people in, in, uh, in demonstrations on how to do things like this that use just little tiny pieces of solder. Um, and for me, that seems like a lot of extra work. But everybody has their own own way of doing stuff. One thing that you can do if you have trouble getting your solder to like lean up on these sloped areas, the flux does, when you get it hot, it does get sticky. So if I lightly heat this while I'm, while I'm positioning these, a lot of times they'll stick to it because it's fluxed. That is a good tip that I wish someone had told me early on to get it a little sticky with the heat. Let's 
put one over here on the end. That one I think I'm just going to tuck underneath there. Why not? Okay, so I got a whole bunch on there. I got some on the inside. I want to make sure those are touching the sides. One of them isn't here. Some people lean them up against the sides. I don't think you need to do that as long as you have contact with both. Okay. So I got most of them where I wanted to. This one kind of fell off. That's all right. So I'm going to heat around the outside here. There's a little surface area in the middle, so periodically I'm going to hit that. But most of the heating is going to go right to the outside here. Okay, and if you watch, the solder is pretty quickly starting to flow. What I really need to, to get hot enough is the sheet on the bottom. That is the least exposed to the heat because we're heating from above. And so it takes a little more effort and focus of the heat in the right places to get that sheet hot. That's one of the tricks that it kind of figure out over time. So I'm going to look around here and see if I see any spots where it looks like I've missed. And I think there's a little bit down here. So I'm just to be safe, I'm going to throw another another piece or two of solder on here. I'd rather have a little too much than not enough. The thing is, these ropes, uh, because they're two wires twisted together, have a lot of surface area on them. So they can absorb quite a bit of solder before you start to lose the definition uh, that it has that makes it look like a rope. But you still don't want to overdo it too much. One of the most important things about soldering effectively, as, as I've learned over the years, is um, is to get everything up to the soldering temperature. If you if you if you don't keep your torch moving around and the silver, it's always like this. Uh, if I even if I'm just soldering a part over here. When I'm heating the thing, I want to heat the whole thing because if I'm not heating this part over here because I'm only trying to solder over here, I end up actually getting the metal around the solder too hot while this is acting as a radiator area that's bleeding heat off over there. So it's hard to get the whole thing hot unless you keep the heat moving around over the whole thing the entire time. So I'll probably say that in every video that I do just because that's one of the primary reasons people have problems is they're not moving the heat around enough. Okay, let's clean this up a little bit. And for this one, since we're just doing a basic, simple kind of thing, I'm not going to put any other decorations on this. I'm just going to trim off the sheet around it, uh, around that rope shape that we just made. So I'm just going to use some shears here. These little Fisker shears, honestly, for thinner silver sheet, are amazing and they're cheap. They're just craft shears, I believe. The best ones I ever found were uh, um, OXO uh, kitchen shears of a particular model that I really loved and worked great for this. Uh, and then they discontinued that model. And I, I even called the company and tried to get them to see if they, they had a box of them somewhere that they'd be willing to sell me some. Because my one pair originally uh, finally broke after a while. What I'm doing now is I'm just filing down the excess sheet that I couldn't cut off with the shears. So I'll just kind of work that off there. I like to angle the angle it underneath the rope so that you can't actually see any sheet from the top. It just looks like the rope is the border. That's one of those things. I think if you don't get rid of that, uh, it looks sort of amateurish. Okay, so I just kind of 
filed it so it's flush from the top. You can see it looks like it's just a rope going around the outside. Okay. Now we need to make a band for it. I've chosen for this one, I'm going to use two pieces of 14 gauge square. I pre-measured them roughly to the size that I wanted them to be uh, before the video, so they're relatively close. I'm just going to file them flat, make sure they're the same length. And then we'll uh, show you how I solder these together to make a, a simple kind of uh, pretty little style of band. Okay, let's straighten these guys out a little bit. I found that these flat nose pliers like this work really good for holding it when you're trying to straighten stuff. The jaws of the pliers are wide enough to where they spread out the force you're putting on the silver a little bit more so it doesn't ding it up as badly. A lot of people use nylon jawed pliers for that, which is, is good too. I have tried those and I find that uh, the metal has a tendency to slip in the jaws unless you're squeezing so tight that it, it starts to uh, crush the, the vinyl inside of the jaws. So. That hasn't been my favorite thing. I keep a pair around for some things, but not don't use them very often. That one's slightly longer than the other one, so I'm just going to file it a few more strokes here. Let's see if we got close there now. A little bit more. That's pretty close. All right, so we're going to find the center of this guy. I like to keep a sharpie around because they're good for marking things. Okay. Let's see, three sixteenths. Just put one of those out of the way. Okay. Alright. About right there. See how close we are in the middle by flipping them around. A little bit off. Pretty close. Okay. So, we're going to bend these guys slightly in the middle here. Just not too much, like that. Okay. Do the same thing with this one. Let me try and kind of line up the, the angle pretty close. Not really a set angle you have to use here. Oops, went a little far that time. Close enough. Okay, so what we're going to do is solder these together like this. All right. Okay, so let's put them on the pad here. Get them lined up. Okay. A piece of a decent sized chunk of solder there. And we're just gonna flex it.
throw a little piece of solder on there. Again, when you're heating silver, you always heat the whole thing. You know, if I got one of these wires up to the temperature, uh, which is about 1450 degrees Fahrenheit, but the other one wasn't quite there, the solder is going to melt to the one that reaches the temperature and not stick to the other one. So that's why ideally you want them to hit that temperature about the same time so that your solder will just kind of puddle and stick to both of them there. So, got that guy to flow. Sometimes if I tap it, it comes off of there. Okay. Alright, so now we got kind of a V on either side. I usually pick whichever side looks the nicest. Make that the outside. I think this side is going to be the nicest looking one. And then we're going to grab our ring mandrel. And up near the top here, I'm going to start pulling it around that like that. But periodically I'm going to flip it over like this. The ring mandrel has a taper on it. And it's going to try and make these guys twist funny. The other thing is, square wire, when you start to bend it into a circle, I don't know if you can see at this angle, but when I was pushing it, these guys start to twist outwards. This one started to twist outwards. I oftentimes use the square the square ones to correct for that because it really it really wants to do that. So you might need to periodically stop that happening and then go back here and then push it further. So. Push it up here a little bit. Tap these downwards. Flip it over. Okay. So I was shooting for about seven and a half, eight. That's about where I'm at, so that's pretty good. All right. Generally, I have to do a little manual shaping on these ones, so I'm just going to do a little uh, adjusting with the pliers to try and get these guys to line up a little bit. Looks similar on both sides. And it, this this is where you have some options as far as what you want to do. A lot of people want to uh, like to bend them out like that way, so they kind of flare outwards on either side. You could do that if you wanted to. Uh, some people like to do uh, where they bend inwards, like this. I think I might do that this time, where they kind of go inwards like that and then attach to the, the top of the, the ring. We'll go on top of these. Kind of like that look sometimes. More like that. So I think I'm going to change them both to that, that style. hardest part I have on doing this is getting getting both sides relatively symmetrical. That's always one of the challenges of when you're trying to get things to look the same on both sides. Of course I guess you wouldn't have to make them both the same on both sides. You could do you could do one in and one out. That might look kind of cool. Or you could do them both sweeping one direction and the other sweeping in the opposite direction. I think those would be nice. Alright, so when I'm doing this, I'm also looking at the level of these guys, how flat they are to each other. And Because eventually here, I'm going to take the file and I'm going to try and file a nice flat surface. Because what we're going to do is we're going to mount this, we're going to take the bezel that we created, turn it upside down like this, and we'll mount this thing on there like that. And to do that nicely, I need to flatten those out so it sits a little better. So we're going to do that. So this might take me a minute guessing when I'm editing this I'm going to speed this part up.
Okay, I think that's probably pretty good. Way to test to see how your how it sits on your ring. It's pretty good. So now one thing we need to decide, you don't have to, this is kind of an abstract shaped stone. It doesn't have to go just like this. You could do it like this, do it kind of like that. I kind of like them offset sometimes, so I think I might do it something like that. Um, if you're doing a symmetrical stone, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll eyeball the center of the stone and I'll make a mark with a sharpie all the way down so I can see it from the back side so I can extend it over here. So when I go to line this up and try and get it straight, I'll have those as a guide to help me with because I, I'm terrible at getting these guys straight sometimes. So, so that's a little tool that I use, but let's see. So I wanted it like, kind of like that. We're going to turn it a little angle like that. Okay. I'm just going to kind of center it there. And then um, find my flux here, or my uh, solder. Cut myself a few little pieces of solder here. Okay, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to flux this, get it crusty, and then I'm going to put uh, four pieces of solder. I might not even need four because Sometimes when you set these in here, it's touching both both the, the bezel part, the bottom of the bezel there, as well as the band part. Just to be safe, I'm going to put all four of them in there. So when you go to heat these guys, the band being up on top, heat rising and everything, gets hot pretty easily. Uh, also, we're heating from above, kind of, so that, that also exposes it to the heat more easily. So when I do this, I'm going to focus kind of around the base, where the bezel and the rope are. You know, and then when the solder starts to flow, I might move the heat up a little bit. But I'm watching the solder here, and I think, hopefully you can see with the camera, when it starts to flow, you want to make sure it get the heat right over all four of those prongs there. Because you want the, or not prongs, uh, uh, four posts of the band there, I guess, uh, in order to make sure those also reach that 1450 degrees temperature. So, and it looks like I got it, just glancing at it. So I'm going to go ahead and pickle it, uh, and then we'll set the stone and polish. Okay, let that pickle for a while, and let's see how this is going. All right, that looks pretty cleaned up. Okay, so typically I don't like to leave the bezel quite as tall as it is, uh, so I'm going to file it down just a skosh.
So, what I was just doing with the pliers there was kind of stripping off some of the leftover uh, burrs on the edge from filing. One of the things that surprised me when I first started doing this was finding out that typically when you have a closed back bezel like this, uh, there's something behind it lifting the stone up to the correct level for the bezel to fit right uh, in the right position on the sides of the stone. Uh, if you look at a lot of Native American jewelry, you'll find sawdust uh, packed behind it. Uh, some people use uh, all sorts of strange stuff. Um, I I've found that tag board seems to hold up the best as far as uh, uh, not losing its uh, substance over time as moisture might get underneath the stone and such. It still seems to hold together and keep the stone tight in there. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually cut a little bit of this tag board. I'm gonna start with a couple. I think my stone itself isn't terribly thick um, and I don't really want to file that bezel any further down. So I'm just gonna roughly shape this into the shape of the stone. It doesn't have to be beautiful. You do however want it to be not so small that the stone will be rocking on it when you're uh, when you set it on top of that but you also don't want it to be so big like right there I'd have to force that in there if you force it in part of the tag board will ride up the side of the bezel and cause your stone to sit at an angle and we can avoid that easily just by making sure it's loose enough to just fall out of there freely good way to check would be to just flip it over and see if it comes out So another thing I'd do is uh, you know, probably take a couple of levels of this to, to lift the stone up to just the right height. So I usually put in uh, more than I think I need, more layers of this, with the idea that it's, it's a little easier to pull it out if you have too many in there uh, than if you have too few and you jam the stone way down in there. If you have a snug bezel you may have trouble getting it out of there. Uh, and so I like to avoid that issue, if I can, by stacking it up too high to start with and then gradually removing them. So I'm going to... see. I need to shape the top of my bezel again a little bit because it got bent a bit when I was filing. Straighten it out here. Throw those guys back in there. Let's see where we're at height wise. Okay, so when I push down on that pretty hard, I can see that the top of the bezel here does not reach far enough up in order to be able to be bent over the curve of the stone there. So that's what I'm looking for here. Oopsie. It's gonna be one of those days. Okay, so I'm gonna take one of those out and see how it looks. Because three was just too many, so we'll see how two looks. All right. And two, I think, is just fine. It's almost too deep with two. I could, if I wanted to, uh, peel one of these in half to make it just slightly higher, but I think I'm going to go with just being a little bit, uh, a little bit low, because I'd rather have it securely in there uh, than riding the very edge of being secure. So, uh, so we'll go ahead and set this in here. doing a little smoothing here. <clears throat> I'm 
some setting. For me. A lot of people use different tools to do this. I found that uh, for me the needle nose pliers has all of the surfaces I need on it to do it. First step that I do, if you've ever watched my bezel video, is I'm using the flat side of the, the needle nose pliers to push push that bezel up tight against the stone to start with and then once I have it relatively tight up against the stone then I take that same flat edge and I'm going to start rolling it over the stone and I'm using a lot of pressure when I'm doing this so like I said there's a lot of people use different tools there's a tool called a rocker tool that pushes bezels down pretty well uh, there's a standard burnishing tool that a lot of people use. Um, but I found that I can get all of the things that I need out of the little chain nose or needle nose pliers here. Okay, so once you've got it curved and laid over the curve of the stone like that, the last step is called burnishing. And I use the rounded outer part of the needle nose pliers here. And what I'm doing is I'm just kind of taking that and rubbing it there's quite a bit of pressure right where the edge of that touches the stone and I'm really kind of, if you can see it, it'll, it'll peel off any of those last burrs that were left there and it leaves kind of a shiny, shiny line on the top edge because it's really pushing it down hard over the stone there and smoothing it out. So, I usually tell my beginners that when they're setting a stone, if their hands don't hurt a little bit the next day, they weren't probably doing it hard enough. The more you do this, the stronger your fingers get over time, too. It, it becomes uh, interesting because people can't understand how you're applying so much pressure, but a lot of it is just figuring out the right angles and the ways to hold things in order to apply that pressure. So. And I think that's looking pretty good so far. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go ahead and take this into the polishing room. Well, I'll probably do a little cleanup with the Dremel, uh, like right here and stuff. And then I'll, I use the Dremel to do the insides of these guys. Uh, because the, the little finger-shaped polishing things that go on your polishing machine are a little bit scary to me. Uh, but I like, I like the Dremel for the insides. The outsides we'll do on the polishing wheel though. So I'll bring this back when we're done and we'll call it good. Okay. And there's the final product. I went ahead and after I polished it, I used a little uh, oxidizing compound that I have to turn the recessed areas darker. Um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of those you can get. A lot of people use a substance called liver of sulfur. And uh, I use something called Black Max that uh, comes as a premixed stuff that you just uh, touch to the surface and it immediately turns it black. It, it, it turns the surface into silver oxide and then you polish off the spots where you don't want it to be. Um, it kind of brings out the character, shows off some of the detail a little bit more easily when you're looking at it. So. But that's it. There's the ring. Please consider uh, liking this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And if you could share it with others who you might uh, who might find it useful as well, that'd be great. And I would love it if you would subscribe to my channel. So um, thanks again, and feel free to leave comments for me, uh, including constructive criticism. Uh, take care and happy silversmithing.